song written by Tom McBean. It's called The Patriot Game. And it applies today as it did any other day. was a trade unionist, communist, a member of the IRA and Republican Congress. He lost his life fighting fascism as a member of the International Brigades at the Battle of Cordoba in December 1936. So what inspired young men like Frank Conroy and over 200 of his fellow countrymen, who, according to Frank Ryan, included amongst its number members of the Republican Congress, the Labour and Republican parties, the IRA and trade unionists, to travel from Ireland to defend the Spanish Republic. At a public meeting in late 1936 to organise support for the Spanish Republic, Sean Murray, former IRA commander and General Secretary of the Communist Party of Ireland, outlined the international importance of the struggle against fascism in the Spanish state. He said, The gallant people of Spain are not only fighting against the traitors within Spain, 
but against the enemies of liberty throughout all of Europe, Ireland included. This makes the Spanish question indeed a question for the friends of freedom in every land. Are we in Ireland to stand aside and allow this crime against the people of Spain to be carried out before our eyes? Frank Conroy did not stand aside. Our first speaker today is local historian James Dorney. James is the author of several books, including works on the Time War and Civil War in Canary. And James has recently conducted research into Frank Conroy's life and will tell us a bit about his background. So, follow James. I first heard about uh, Frank Conroy many years ago and discovered that he was from Kildare. But um, we were unsure of exactly where in Kildare he was from, and it was always thought that he was from Kildare Town. We recently discovered that he was actually born in Kilcullen in 1914. His father was uh, from Leash and his mother was from Dublin. They had married in Dublin, and his father was a, a baker by trade, and he had come to Kilcullen seeking work because uh, work was precarious in the 1930s as much as it is now in uh, the 21st century. So they arrived at Kilcullen and I don't know how long they stayed there and perhaps uh, maybe next year when we're having our commemoration we'll be having it in Kilcullen, we won't be having it in Kildare Town because now we know for sure where he is from. But he was back in Dublin by the time he made his confirmation. So um, we assumed then that he, he, he returned to um, his father's or his mother's home place and that. So he ends up going to Spain. He was a, a communist in a time when it was a very great time to be a communist in Ireland. He was a socialist. He was also an IRA volunteer. And he ended up going to Spain to fight fascism. He left for Spain on the Dunleary of Hollywood Ferry on the 13th of December 1946 with about 25 other Irish volunteers, including Frank Ryan. The men were all ex-members of the IRA, the Irish Citizen Army, Irish Republican Congress, and the Six County Socialist Party. Many of them, but not all, were communists. Frank Conroy gave no next of kin when he was leaving Ireland. And um, Frank Ryan told an Irish press reporter at the quayside, the Republican contingent, besides being a very efficient fighting force, every member of it having been an action, was also a demonstration. It's a demonstration of the sympathy of revolutionary Ireland with the Spanish people in their fight against international fascism. It is also a reply to the intervention of Irish fascism in the war against the Spanish Republic, which, if unchallenged, would remain a disgrace on our people. The, these volunteers went to England and then from there, from England over to, to Spain. They crossed the border then. Uh, they left, uh, they crossed the border, arrived in Albert Chief in the main base of the Internationals in the early morning of 17th of December. Frank Ryan organised 43 of the Irish volunteers for service in the Marseillaise Battalion of the 14th Brigade. They left for the Cordova front on Christmas Eve. The Irish men were mostly Dubliners, but both the battalion's number one company of 145 English speakers. The task of the one company was to capture the town of Lutera, the south of the road between Andujar and Cordova. The men were badly equipped, of course, and, went, and they suffered badly in this battle. Five Dublin men, James Foley, Anthony Fox, Michael May, Michael Nolan and Thomas Wood, John Meehan from Galway and Frank Conroy were killed, and almost all the other Irish soldiers here in the field were wounded. But Frank had only arrived in Spain a couple of days, and in a couple of days of arriving in Spain, he was dead. <laughs> On Christmas Eve, the company had been 145 strong, and when they returned out to Chief the following month, only 67 men remained. The start to fight Steve's bed, dead in Spain, was, very, was not known in Ireland at the time, and only recently has it come to light. So it makes me very proud to be standing here in the county that Frank Conroy was born in. And it's great to be able to speak to people who have the same interest in these men that went off to fight fascism in the 1940s in Spain. Thank you very much.
Thanks, James. Um, just our next, uh, we've just a uh, bit of music uh, next. Uh, there's been many inspirational songs written about the Spanish War. One of the best, most well known being written by Palermo and Kristen Moore. But perhaps a lesser well known but equally inspiring song is by US folk singer Phil Oaks. I'll just call on Tom O'Brien uh, to sing the, sing the Spanish Civil War song by Phil Oaks. Thanks, Tom. session to warfare that was to take the toll of eight Irish lives. Our next speaker is Harry Owens, a historian of the Spanish Civil War, who has worked tirelessly for decades in documenting and preserving the memory of the international brigaders from Ireland. He's an expert on the history of the Spanish Civil War and is going to give us a talk now on, on the Battle of Cordoba and, and uh, Frank Connery's uh, role in that. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks Mary. Well, as they say, this is where you get the few words from your sponsor. Uh, I was asked to give the same talk I gave here two years ago, but while I kept the structure, Ireland and everything around us has moved on in two years, and not always for the better. <coughs> so just to begin, after the First World War, the new Irish Free State and the Spanish Republic were the only new democracies to emerge in Europe under their own steam. All the other new states, many of which are now reconstituted, were created by the big powers at the Versailles Peace Conference. Both the Irish Free State, its national and republican movements, and the Spanish Republic were driven by one primary need of their peoples, and that was the right to the land. In the case of the Irish, through a massive 
popular organization of the poorest people and on a peaceful basis, inventing the weapon of solidarity which existed, but the boycott, a word which has gone around the world and was created by the peasants who did not own even the ground they stood on. They won the land, but in Spain, the position went to violence and we had the Spanish Civil War. In the 1930s, after a sudden financial collapse of the great 1920s boom, banks were closing in the USA and Europe, employers cut wages and jobs, and governments said they were obliged, in their words, to cut basic welfare and their very meagre dole payments. That austerity policy made a financial crisis into a world depression. Here in Ireland, the right wing, who controlled state power, fought against workers' right to join unions, and against the left and those Republicans who stood with the workers in defending un the unemployed, the underpaid, and tenants who were being evicted from their homes. In Leitrim, a small farmer was deported because of the communist Red Scare. In Dublin, Charlie Donnelly was jailed for helping pickets for the right to join a union on the Somac shirt factory. An old woman in York Street tenements was evicted because her income was 10 shillings a week in total, but her rent for one tenement room was 10 shillings and sixpence if she didn't eat. The interim report on Dublin slum clearance found that 90,000 people lived in one room tenements, and 40,000 of those people were living in rooms condemned by the Medical Officer of Health. The IRA members who formed the Republican Congress were the ones who saw that the danger to public Neheran was a danger to Pubble Neheran, and they were prepared to unite and fight it, and to join with organizations they would never have stood with before. If we look at the program of the 1919 First Doyle, we find it says all right to property must be subordinated to the public right and welfare whose first duty must be the welfare of children. And this republic would create an effective public health care system. The program was adopted unanimously, without debate. But within four months, de Valera would announce that it was postponed. And later, Kevin O'Higgins would say it was mostly poetry. Yet the speaker introducing it had proclaimed, a nation cannot be said to live fully in spirit or materially, unless there, um, when there is denied to any section of the people a share of the wealth and the riches that God bestowed around them. Father O'Flanagan, who read the prayer that opened that first independent Irish Parliament, stood here outside at that monument in 1935 at its unveiling, which was one year before Spain's civil war when he inaugurated this monument to the seven workers shot in the Irish Civil War for being caught with weapons, just as General Franco would be shooting Spanish workers a year later, caught with weapons, who were resisting his rebellion against Spain's newly elected reforming government. And that was barely 15 years separating these two events when Irish and Spanish military authorities applied the same policy. Heather O'Donnell, who organized the ex-IRA volunteers into the Republican Congress in 1934, took a first step into the Spain's war when he needed a break. He said, crowds had got into the habit of singing hymns at me and throwing bottles, and I missed a turn for Scotland and took instead the road for Spain. I had walked into a civil war in Ackham over a sub-post office just as I walked into one in Spain, and it was the same civil war. A picture of Acco is a snapshot of Spain. The uproar which the news from Spain caused in my own country rekindled the antagonism of our own civil war. All wars are fought between devils and angels. War propaganda remains the most monotonous of all human crimes. So we'd ask ourselves, why did these Republicans and left-wingers go to fight in Spain? Frank Ryan was asked this by the Gestapo when he was captured in March 1938. And he said, because it's the same fight in both places. And then he asked the Gestapo man, what are you doing in Spain? Claude Coburn, a journalist who later worked in Ireland, was also in Spain as a young man at that very point. He said these Spaniards were fighting to protect not only what they had, but what they hoped for. They thought democracy meant power to the people. They had a clear understanding of what would happen to the workers 
the peasants and the intellectuals. If the fascist attack led by General Franco were to succeed, their trade unions and village committees would be destroyed. Wages and salaries would be pushed down to poverty levels and kept there for years to come. An illiterate peasant from north of Almeria said to me, if those people win, my children will never get an education either. Padre O'Donnell said that the Spanish workers had the experience of the backward developments which mocked the promises of their 1931 Republic's declaration. And this warned them that governments can only be trusted as far as you can drive them. Spanish middle class farmers saw that the small men were in misery, but they said, if the landless get their way, the countryside will be filled with paupers calling themselves farmers. Yet wages were as low as three pesetas a day. And that working day lasted for as long as there was daylight. And hardly a single labourer that Padre Don met could read and write. After the right wing won the November 1903 elections in Spain, Ramon Sendor heard the landlord say they would grind their peasants down to liet the weeds in the ditches. And many a labourer's family in Spain had to do that in the winter of 1935 during the two black years of Spain's right wing Republican government. In February 1936, a reforming government was elected by the people, but the generals rebelled that July. And the following December, at Lopera in Cordoba, the first Irish units in the new international brigades went into action as a unit. Walter Greenhow from Manchester was a friend of many of those Irish. He described, we were marched to trucks, off to the railway station, all night in a train. Early next morning we arrived in a warmer climate. As we marched out of the station through a warehouse, each man got a rifle. On the stock of the rifle was a brass plate which said 1876. They were single loading shot, shots, though later some would get magazines that you could fit in. As we marched out of the town, we were given bits of rags to clean off the rifle grease. That night we slept by the side of the road. An Irishman came over to me. Have you ever seen a Lewis machine gun? I'd only been a drummer in the Territorial Army as a teenager. Well, he said, I've got a French Chauchau machine gun. And every so often the bullet comes out of line and won't fire. He needed someone to straighten the bullet while he operated the gun. Patrols went forward to Villa del Rio on the road and the railway line from Cordoba to Andujar, but the facets were already there and opened heavy machine gun fire. We practiced our guns during the night and next morning we went in trucks till we heard a plane and took cover at the side of the road. It came down and strapped both sides and a man named Seagull was killed, our first casualty. I think MacDade, the Irishman, was in charge of the Irish there. We took a hill with little fighting and were told we'd attack Lopera at dawn. The cold was so bad that waiting for the dawn, I wanted the dawn and the daylight to come, even though I knew as soon as the daylight came, we'd be getting killed. But he said the cold was that bad, all you wanted was a bit of sunshine. I the dawn did come, and we could see the fascists on either side of the valley bringing their machine guns up. But there was still the none of the artillery fire that we'd been promised. The fascists were openly taking up positions on either side of us, but our old guns couldn't reach that distance. Suddenly their artillery began firing, and then the fascist machine guns opened up and they could reach us. The air was alive with bullets. We slithered from the crest to join the rest, but things were no better there. We were caught in a crossfire from both flanks. Our only chance lay in running the gauntlet of this murderous crossfire and getting back to the position we'd taken the day before. The wonder was that any of us survived, that the whole British company was not wiped out that day. Even relatively experienced volunteers like Commissar Ralph Fox and the English poet John Cornford who fought in Madrid were both killed, as were Frank Conroy, Leo Green, Henry Bonard, Michael May, Jim Foley, Johnny Meehan, Tony Fox, Michael Nolan, and young Tommy Woods from Dublin. George Nathan, our commander, had ordered retreat by sections and kept them in order so that his inexperienced men withdrew section by section, firing as they went. The Irish section, which had been occupying the most advanced position, lost nearly half their number killed and wounded during the withdrawal. Afterwards, the battalion met and court-martialed their French commander, Major Lasalle, and had him shot. 
Frank Conroy's body and those of his dead comrades lie somewhere in the hills around Lopera today. The Western democracies prefer to let Spain fall to fascism rather than help a fellow democracy to defend itself until their policy led the whole of Europe into war within three years. And for anybody who wants to visit that grave, in 2016, Eddie O'Neill, who's sitting there at the end of the couch, will be bringing a group over, organised with the Friends of the International Brigade in Madrid, and the local socialist mayor in El Duhar has located the area where he thinks those graves are. So if you're thinking ahead for a year and a half, plan a little holiday in Andalusia with Eddie. George Gilmore's account of the Republican con Congress ends with this conclusion. The belief still held by the trade union rank and file that Fina Foy was leading to a real republic was still the dominating force. To break that illusion was the aim of the Republican Congress, and in that we failed. We failed, in a word, to bring forward organised labour into the leadership of the national anti-imperial struggle. The junction of those forces did not hold. The industrial section withdrew from the task for which it was not ready, and the opportunity in those critical years was lost. Perhaps in the story of our failure, there may be some pointers towards making an effective alliance between progressive elements. The reconquest of Ireland by its people awaits the day when those forces meet and hold. Padre O'Donnell has warned us that in great island shifting conflicts, you only get a glimpse of the root issue before churning passions rouse up some old battle cry of clan or nation or religion. Our challenge today is to turn this crisis into a transformation. It's to abolish the control by the elites who caused it and the complete impunity of our Irish billionaire class, the gross overpayment and tax scandals of our millionaires. If the public health service is so good, in a republic, shouldn't the Minister of Health be the first to use it? If public transport is fit for service, shouldn't a Minister for Transport have to use it too? We live in a republic, so our elected representatives should be proud and willing and anxious to be seen to share what they provide for us public. And if they have to use these services, they will work for you and me. Things like health are too important to be privatised. Giant multinationals are tax resident nowhere, but they demand free access to the world markets. They dominate communications with positive, pleasant company logos, but they provide access to everything, including pornography, and to the security services of major powers who spy on their trusting users. The taxes paid by these multinational stateless companies are only levied on their workers on the salaries of employees, not the company's massive profits which are held off. Governments that help these companies to do this are the enemies undermining us all. The buying teams of Tesco and Dunn's have more power over agriculture than any minister. And yet when our doll wants to pass a bill on controlling and taxing chewing gum, phone calls from the American Chamber, Irish American Chamber of Commerce were enough to stall it. Meanwhile, the European Union is examining the sweetheart deals whereby multinationals were promised in advance that they would never be asked to pay our nominal 12.5% corporate taxes. The European Union and the US trade deals are giving corporations the right, the rights to act like sovereign nations, whom they can even sue if those nations protect their electorates. And thus, they open up markets for privatizing services and public procurement. We are seeing a huge concentration of wealth and power into ever fewer hands. And we are seeing the undermining of the collective organizing of ordinary people to offset it. The right are using this crisis to destroy regular, secure jobs, to impose minimum wages and less on growing numbers of unemployed. And those who have jobs will have precarious jobs. The precarious, as they're called, those whose jobs are never safe. Tragically, Spain has become the leading example of the destruction of almost an entire middle class, of the secured or unionized full-time jobs for workers. Hourly wages in horticulture there can be as low as 450, well below the legal minimum wage. The gains of 40 years of struggle by Spain's middle and working classes have been abolished, quote, 
due to the crisis. Those who are kept in their jobs, as under General Franco, are the ones who know their place. And any job for young people will be on a take it or leave it basis by the triumphant employers. We've had three industrial revolutions in our modern history. The first based on steam engines, engines. the second on technologies like electricity, cars and chemicals. The third is the information technology revolution. But only now is that revolution about to receive its massive impact. And for decades, artificial intelligence failed to deliver on its promises. But you are now at the edge when the ability of technology to sort through massive bat data banks and detect patterns and the cheapening power of computers means that the robot production is moving into a new phase. Originally developed mainly in the car and motor industries, it's now going to be applied right across industry through the simple thing of getting rid of workers. Human beings are inefficient by nature. It is more efficient, though not necessarily more effective, to get rid of the people and bring in the robot. And this is going to include people like university lecturers, because you'll have distant learning, and you can have a far better lecturer <coughs> who's on DVD and can be put on than any lecture you can get. You'll get a far better medical expert than an open GP, but you'll have to go online. We're going to see a massive de-skilling of the liberal, better off professionals who dominated, just as we've seen a massive loss of work for the skilled workers who dominated the trades and crafts. And that's going to extend down to the semi-skilled and unskilled worker making sandwiches or loading bread in bakeries. Loading bread by robot is 80% more productive and 50% cheaper. You make the price of your robot back in two, in two years. The robots are cheaper and they will be able to have cars produced again back in the West. You won't have to ship them from Asia. You'll be able to select the colour of your car and the robot will turn out each car differently. They will be made to order, but they won't have workers. There's a joke in the robotic industry. What's the factory of the future? A thousand robots, a man and a dog. What's the dog for? It's to bite the man if he touches anything. It's a joke, but the joke is on us. Robots can eliminate so many people that as a society they can improve our access to services but not for the increasingly thousands of jobless people and the jobless who are looking for work that has been abolished. So who will benefit by the increased quantity and quality of output? Who will control the wealth? Clearly in one sense all these cutbacks, the austerity doctrine, the drive to privatise, to outsource, the zero hour contracts, temporary and part time jobs. These are all what an Italian Marxist economist Riccardo Bellifiori calls part of an attack on labour. Labour is another word for all of us. Nouria Rubini, the Nobel Prize winner economist, said you cannot keep shifting income from labour to capital without having an excess of capacity and a lack of demand. What's individually rational for a company is a self-destructive process. Now what this expert means is free markets don't work. Entire economies like the United States were rescued from depression in the 1930s by massive state investment, especially in public works which created great contracts and employment, and by labour laws that Roosevelt brought in to make sure that the money he put into the economy went down to the workers' pockets and got spent, and that absorbed the extra production produced by the investment. It's what you call a virtuous cycle. Today, We've had a similar massive public investment be made by our state money, but this time in the very banks that once again, as in the 30s, have caused the problem. And it stays in the banks. It's as if you had a cancer victim and you were given something to help the cancer grow. That's literally what we're doing. If we have to have banks, they have to be non-profit, non publicly owned and independent bodies like credit unions or the building societies we used to have. What we've got now are private financial institutions so big they dominate governments that are allowed, they are allowed to pay scandalous bonuses and profits to those who control them and they can have their losses paid by you and me if they make them. Cyprus's parliament recently rejected the European land plan for a bail-in where all those in Cyprus who had money in the bank were going to pay for the bank's rescue. Their Cypriot leaders were trying to protect the rich depositors, especially the Russians who had big money in Cyprus. But the parliament rejected it. In the end, 
47% of all money in accounts worth over 100,000 were taken to the horror of the European Central Bank. But nobody under 100,000 in a deposit was touched. 4% of the people with deposits paid for the rescue, and that 4% were the wealthy. Two thirds of them were foreigners, and half of them were Russians, many of them Russian mafia money. The mafia weren't worried. They make a thousand percent. Once I laundered through a bank in Cyprus, I don't mind if it's 500 percent, it's legal now. We make a thousand percent, we can write off 500. The amazing thing is that the Cypriot economy, including their banks, are still flourishing. But the government were forced to take a 45 percent cut in all ministers' pay. But when it went down the line to the bottom, the lowest worker only lost six and a half percent. That produced solidarity. And that solidarity meant that the Cypriot economy, even with 20% unemployment, did not fall by 20% as all the experts said, it only fell 9%. The country had big problems, but it's stable, unlike Greece. And as one of their senior officials said to a correspondent, if we'd taken their bank rescue the way they were putting it in, we'd be just like Greece is today. If a people decide, like the United States did in the 30s, like Cyprus did recently, or like the Irish may be deciding over water, that we will not accept their own solution. We can design fairer and better ways. And whether it's the 1930s or today, the same fight and duty to organize is there. What we're moving to is a society so distorted by wealth and power, it actually resembles the society that fascism was trying to achieve before the Second World War. That is, with an elite who have access to great power and wealth, who dominate a mass of economically powerless individuals, mere consumers, who accept a small share in wealth allotted to us, and we can vote, but we can change nothing. Some of us perhaps might even get a chance at a minor post in running a limited area of this new world order, but where we will all be under constant surveillance, and we better learn to accept it. A society depending on overproduction, overconsumption, a society fed artificially enhanced but unhealthy food, living lives drawn to endless new games, competition, adult toys, while our average fitness and health decline and our planet is pillaged and ruined. Where we know how to use the latest digital technology and we know the names of all the famous media stars of this week, but we don't know the name of a single plant that we walk on in our backyard, how to grow vegetables or catch a fish, where children don't climb trees, never camp outdoors and light fires. Where health is not about preventing illness, it's about the business we make by treating it at greater and greater expense. This is a safe, controlled, but definitely a sick society. We didn't decide to become like this. It was driven by huge marketing campaigns and expensive consumer research, and it took decades. In 1980s, I came across the Spanish bank reports describing this, where they explained that marketing was designed to make you go out and buy it now even though you have the money. And they provide the credit, but now we have you in debt. And the aim is to keep you in debt. And secondly, any product you will buy, we already have a better one. When a week later you go out, turn on your TV, you'll see a better fridge, or a better hi-fi system, or a better digital phone. The aim is to keep you permanently dissatisfied. The dissatisfied consumer society is always looking to its next product, its next game, its next movie, its next adult toy. And this is the process of overconsumption, of dissatisfaction that drives it. Nothing wears out, it becomes out of date. Out of date is a mentality that's embedded in the consumer society. <laughs> this is something our environment Kansas, cannot sustain. In 2007, the last Irish Brigadier Bob Doyle said, today's environment crisis cannot be solved by big business because capitalism is now its cause. Big business hopes that tinkering with it will allow them to hold on to their wealth and power. The vision of a world where we live in brotherhood and in harmony with our environment it seems as far away as it ever did. While globalization, which is the worldwide triumph of money over unionized workers, flourishes. As always, what fascism means is the rich using the poorest to destroy the organized working class. Today, we can refuse to remain just individuals. We can organize. It's not just water we want kept public 
as one TD complained, if we have a referendum on water, what about the ESB and the other services? That's right. That's where we're going. It should all be guaranteed public. And a whole lot more. We can make our country move towards the kind of vision of that door the father of finding it open, and for which Frank Conroy fought and died, trying to help Spanish people achieve it. If we win, our example will be a signal for others, like today's Spanish generations. Above all, we can be certain that we then won't have to write someday what George Gilmore wrote about the Republican Congress. Because if our existing elites do survive, we will have failed again, and then we will hear the tragic words of Father Flanagan. They have fooled you again. As Bob Doyle told us, let's not fool ourselves. Fascism is thriving today in the institutions of power. So I ask, did my comrades die in vain? If you, the next generation, do nothing, then fascism, which is raw capitalism, will triumph and humanity will face disaster. And then my comrades will have died in vain. It is up to you to fight for a different world, but never forget that you are fighting for an idea. Though we must at times defend ourselves, even with guns, guns cannot impose an idea. The four weapons of victory today are education, organization, civil disobedience, and unity. And that unity is of all those who share a hatred of this fascism and a passion for a better world, which is essential for our success. Let's be patient, but let's move together. The future of all of us is at stake. Together we fight on. My sincere thanks for a second opportunity to speak here in Kildare to Michael Healy and his comrades and friends, and to invite you all, if possible, next weekend to accompany Eddie O'Neill and his busload going down to Ackle on Sunday, Sunday morning, where we will be commemorating a second brigader located in Ackell, where the first Irishman to die in Spain is also from and has a memorial. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mary for always a delivering of your speeches. Very much to consider. Um, just to say thanks to uh, James and Cormac. Um, and everyone else that came along today. Um, um, I just wanted to say, in terms of Michael Healy has been organising this for the last couple of years, and it's a tribute to Michael in terms of that he's kept the memory of, of Frank Conroy alive, um, and also the ideas for which he gave his life, uh, democracy, internationalism and socialism, and ensuring that they're not forgotten. I just want to call Michael up if he doesn't mind, just make a small presentation to make to him from the Basque Country. Um, so two uh, bases here, Annie and the county just want to make a small presentation to Michael in consideration of the work that he's doing.